Good evening. Good evening. We return now to the subject self completeness in God. And we return to the illustration of the tree. Elsewhere in the writings you will occasionally come across the statement that the I is the only devil. That is that small I. That personal sense of self. that which Paul tells us must die daily in order that we can be reborn of the Spirit. It is this little I, which we know as I, Joel, or I, Mary, that is trying to live its own life, or is trying to live a life of its own, and it says, I, Joel, will do this, or I, Joel, would like to do that. I wish I could do this. If only I had that. I would like to be here, I would like to be there. Oh, if I could just uh, heal people, or teach them spiritual truth, or if only I was successful, or if I knew what to do next, I, 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 I. And all of this time, there is an I that would live our lives for us joyously, successfully, prosperously, abundantly, if only we could give up I, Joel, and let I, God, take over. Again, Paul, I live, yet not I, Christ liveth in me. If only we could give up <coughs> that personal sense of I <coughs> and let this other I, the Christ of us, the real being, take over and live it for us. Now, we know now that it can be done. We know that there have been great religious teachers, leaders, who have accomplished just that, given up their personal sense of life in order that the I, their real being, could live its life through them. And we know that some of them have given us a chart so that we can uh, plot our course along that same line. One of these was the Master, Christ Jesus. And he reveals that I can of my own self do nothing. The Father within me, he doeth the works. If I speak of myself, I speak a lie. I bear witness to a lie. My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Or Paul, I can do all things through Christ. Many others have revealed the same ability to drop that personal sense of self and let this divine self come through. When they do, <clears throat> they find a statement coming to them way down deep uh, within them that says, I am come that ye might be fulfilled. I, this I at the center of our being, which is really God or the Christ man, 
This says to Joel, I am come that ye, Joel, might be fulfilled. So ye, Joel, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, or wherewithal ye shall be clothed. I, your heavenly Father, knoweth that you have need of these things, and it is my good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Whithersoever thou goest, I will go. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. All of this comes from, not from a book, not from scripture, not from a Bible, not from a man who lived 2,000 years ago. All of this comes from way down deep within your own being. In proportion, as you learn, to listen for that still small voice. In uh, this particular state of our being, <clears throat> let us assume that we are a branch on the tree and uh, that as a branch we are concerned about bringing forth fruit. I don't have to tell you what happens. It just can't be because a branch of itself cannot bring forth fruit. And yet, ye are the branches. And yet, ye are trying to live your own lives. Trying to plan for tomorrow. Trying to scheme. Trying to save. Trying to think. Trying to worry and be concerned about tomorrow and ye are the branches. How can you do that? In and of yourselves, you can't live at all. Only by virtue of the fact that you are one with the vine can you live, and then you can only live harmoniously if you can relax and let the vine pour through to you the essence, the substance, the life, that later becomes the flower and the fruit on the branch. From that standpoint then, any one of us can at least begin to die daily, to give up that personal sense of responsibility just by leaning back and think of the vine that is feeding us. Instead of continuing to believe that I must take thought for myself, that I must worry and fret and be concerned and have anxiety for myself. Or you say, ah, oh, but I have no anxiety for myself. I'm thinking of my family. Yes, you are thinking of the other branches on the tree, forgetting that they are at one with the same vine is your family dependent upon you then or upon their connection, their contact, their oneness with the vine? And so even if you have concern or fear for your family, are you not infringing upon the uh, activity of the vine and trying to assume its obligations, its place in your life and in the life of your family? And you say, ah, oh, but my family are not interested in truth. Who cares whether your family is interested in truth? Surely not God. Surely not the Christ. The Christ doesn't ask anyone to be interested in truth. It doesn't even ask them to be good or bad or kind or generous or loving. It lays down no laws. The vine is the avenue through which the husbandman, the father, God, pours forth its good to the branch. And it says that his rain falls on the just and the unjust. And so to believe that it makes a particle of difference to God, whether or not your family are interested in truth, is to concern yourself with that which the Father never thought of. 
Your heavenly Father knoweth that your family have need of these things. And it is your Father's good pleasure to give them the kingdom. Your Father knoweth that your patients and your students have need of these things. And it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Only, what is the Father? Ah, it is on that point that we must be clear in order that we may live the abundant life. I am come that ye may have life and that ye might have it more abundantly. And so in order to live that life, we must know first of all that we as the branch are always at one with the invisible vine and that it in turn is drawing from the infinite source of the Father and yet the branch and the vine and the Father are one. Right here where I am is holy ground. It is the all of the Godhead and all of my individual being. In this awareness, in this understanding, you begin to relax. You begin to let go. You begin to let the Father reveal itself, reveal its plan for you, its nature, its activity for you. The God, the Father, is infinite. And uh, that infinity is manifest through one as a minister, a physician, a lawyer, a nurse, a teacher, a healer. But it is not of your choosing. The Father being infinite manifests itself infinitely. And we play the part that is assigned to us today. It may be a businessman, it may be a housewife, a mother, but there's no use of trying to take the word I and move it out of its orbit. You might as well try to reach up and take a star out of its orbit. You have no right to interfere with the divine plan. And so you begin with where you are and agree that where you are is all right. That is holy ground. It doesn't make a difference. Many people have had to find this in prison in hospitals and begin with the realization the place where I am is all right. The place where I am is holy ground and not try to move themselves out but begin right there to let God take over and let God move them out. Now, if we relax, if we relax from that word I and instead of using it, use the term the Christ or the Father and realize that the Father is working out its plan on earth and that we are here only to show forth the glory of the Father, not to show forth your glory or mine, to show forth the glory of the Father and let, let it begin its work in us, very quickly you will discover this that there is nothing limited about your demonstration. There is nothing limited, confined, or finite about your life, your mind activity, your business activity, or your healing or teaching activity. There's nothing limited about it, except when the word I comes in. You find that, well, I had a letter today. On that very point, of someone uh, saying, I would so love to be in this work. Now you see, they are interfering with the divine plan. They're trying to select their own place. Let the little I uh, swing the Godhead, the Christ, and determine where it should function instead of saying, no, I am satisfied where I am and at each moment of every day I will let the Christ move me about. Not I determine Christ activity. Let the Christ activity determine me and mine. There is no way to bring forth an infinite demonstration, an infinite sense of life 
a more abundant sense of life except through the realization of our self-completeness in God, not in I. Not self-completeness, Joel, self-completeness in God. And the completeness of God is made manifest as the harmony and abundance of Joel. But it still is not Joel's abundance. It still is not Joel's success. It still is not Joel's intelligence or love. It is still the wisdom of the Father, the activity of the Father, the divine grace of the Father. And it just manifests and expresses through Joel as Joel is willing. And I, when I say Joel, I mean William and Mary and all the rest of the names in this room and out in the world. This sense of separation from God constitutes all of the error there is in our experience. This use of the word I constitutes all of the evil that comes into our experience. And only in proportion as we can relax and let the activity of the Christ express itself, manifest itself, perform itself, only in that degree is the demonstration of health harmony, wholeness, abundance, contentment, peace, and security made evident. Of course, I don't have to tell you that this is not as simple as it sounds. There is a discipline to it for the simple reason that we have built up this personal sense of I over a period of thousands of years since uh, the prodigal decided to leave home and uh, be somebody on his own account. And so it is that egotism comes into the picture and says, what? Be dependent on the Father, on God? Always have to turn to God for direction? Where do I come in? Uh, I think I'll live my life. I think I'll determine where I will live and what I will do, and it works too. For a while, for a while, until the breakdown. Because the only reality there is, and the only permanence, is in our completeness, the completeness that comes to us through God, through the realization of the spiritual nature of our being and the ability to let it manifest and express itself in any direction. Now, this brings us to a very, very important facet, let us say, or phase of our existence. It is not too difficult to be what the world calls a go-getter. That is, to be active and alert and make plans and advertise oneself and uh, go out into the world and become known and uh, exert personal influence or bring influence to bear and uh, in many, many ways glorify and magnify the personal sense of I and become very important sometimes. It is much more difficult at first to sit back and rest in one's home, in one's office, in prison if this, that is where this finds one, and let the world come to us. Let the divine activity be brought to our door. Let the demonstration be brought right in on a silver tray. It seems sometimes that that can never happen. At least, it cannot happen to us. But it can. It can happen in this wise. If you once realize that it is the Christ that is the real mind of your being, the real soul, 
the real wisdom and the real love, you will find that everything and everybody will gravitate to that Christ. If you believe that you have this great wisdom and spirituality and goodness of yourself, you will find yourself startlingly left alone noticeably so but catch this vision of the vine and the father and be still while God pours its infinite good through the vine into the branch and then you'll find that without any effort of your own fruitage will appear you will just stand still in being and all of a sudden little buds and blossoms and leaves will break out all over and then we'll follow the fruitage. And all you will be doing is standing still. But in standing still, you will be active about the work that is given to you to do each day. Each one of us has something to do today. Each one of us. It makes no difference what it is, whether it is housework, office work, selling, mechanical work, healing work, teaching work. Each one has something to do for today. If we do that without concern for tomorrow, only do today to the highest sense of our ability and stand still in the realization that the Christ is ever flowing into the branch. The vine is ever pouring God's essence substance into the branch. Going about one's daily work and the realization, just think, right now, while I'm doing this, while I'm reading, while I'm studying, the Father is pouring its bounty into me, the branch, through the invisible Christ of my being, and that's all. And of its own self, the next day something else is given one to do. And then one does that to the best of their ability. And so on until step by step we are led out of the business world, out of the household, out of the family duties, into the wider ministry of healing or teaching or writing or music because there are many, many facets of the activity of the Christ that are not all connected with healing work and teaching of spiritual subjects. The Christ is infinite in its activity and can make of us musicians or mathematicians or builders and they're all equally of God. No one is more spiritual than another. It only means that the architect and the builder is producing his ideas, activities, work through the realization of the divine ideas that are given to him from within. And the musician the same, and the poet and the author the same, and so the practitioner and the teacher the same. It is all the same activity of the Christ appearing in infinite form and variety. Yes, the word I is a devil, the word I would lead us into thinking and doing and being something of ourselves instead of thank you Father thank you Father all that God is I am all that the Father hath is mine and therefore just let me be still in that and then the flow comes and the demands are made upon us in one way or another, activity is brought to our very door, and always, not only it is abundant, but fruitful, successful, because the same Christ that brings the activity to our door fulfills it, performs it. He performeth that which is given me to do. Yes, if he gives it to me to do, he also performs it. When we go out searching for something to do, it isn't always a sign that he has given it to us. 
And it is for that reason that very often we fail because we are trying to do work that we sought, that we found, that we determined we would do, and of course there is no he to perform it. The he that performeth the work that has given me to do is the same he that giveth the work to me. And how do we know when he has given it to me? When he brings it to me. When I do not have to go out and search for it. When I do not have to go out and seek and strive and struggle for it. When it comes to me, then I know he has brought it. And when he has brought it, he likewise performeth it. And so, in every wise, remember our illustration of this tree. John 15, read that, the entire chapter. And gain this vision of the branch and its connection with the tree. But when you are doing that, remember this that your concern for your neighbor, for your family, for the world at large is taking on a responsibility that does not belong to you and that may interfere with your own demonstration. Why? Every branch is connected with the same vine. There is only one Godhead, there is only one vine, and the other branches. But for one branch to assume responsibility for another branch? No. Not responsibility. Cooperation? Yes. Sharing? Yes. Mutualness? Yes. And even then remember that it is not of you. Even if you share of your goods with you, it is not of you. If you share of your goods with your neighbor, with your friend, with your patient, with your student, it is not of you, it is of the Father. Let me illustrate that. If we were to judge by appearances, I am sharing this truth that the Father is giving me with you. That's what the appearances would say, that somewhere invisible there is the Father and the Vine and that they are pouring this marvelous truth into me and through me and I am sharing it or giving it to you. That's the appearance, but it isn't the truth. No, that's not the truth. That is where we must not judge by appearances. This truth is from the Godhead. It is flowing through the invisible vine, the Christ. And it is flowing into your consciousness and mine. And I'm receiving it at the same moment that you are receiving it because I'm receiving it from the same source from which you are receiving it. And so this is nothing of mine that I'm giving you and not even sharing with you something that God gave me. No, no, no. God is this moment through the Christ imparting this truth to all of us here in this room and no one is receiving it from another. Only through appearance does it seem that it's coming out of my mouth into your ear. But do you want to know something? Mouth or ear, ear or mouth. There's only one mind in this room. There's only one consciousness in this room. Only one soul. And this whole activity of truth is taking place in that one mind. And so appearance may say it comes through one to another. Don't believe it. It's coming directly from the Christ to us. And the proof of it is that if I were to close my mouth and sit back here and rest before the evening's over, you still would have this truth. It is God's plan that this truth be voiced. No man or woman has the power to perform it or to prevent its operation and its appearance in your consciousness. Neither the presence nor absence of anyone 
can bring it to you or keep it from you. It is God's will that this truth reach your consciousness and it will reach it if we all sit here in silence. Please believe me that the activity of God cannot be impeded. It cannot be hastened, cannot be hurried, but it cannot be impeded. If anyone entrusted with the word should for any reason fail, the word wouldn't fail, the message wouldn't fail, it would keep right on moving and appearing as someone else. But the word would go right on. Emerson tells us there is nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. And it's true. The time for this revelation of the infinite nature of individual being is come. The time is here when it shall be revealed that we are self-complete in God. The time is here when every individual must know that they draw on the Christ for their good. They do not draw on each other. And because the time has come and because human consciousness is ready to receive it and uh, because God is the author and the finisher of our works, be assured that in this age, this message will reach human consciousness. If at this moment Joel seems to be the avenue or instrument through which it is reaching it, fine. That's just one of those things. That's all. If for any reason Joel took himself away from the scene, the message would go marching right on. It might go marching right on in these books or through this teaching. But if not, another Joel would appear or John or Bill or Mary. There's no way to dam up the activity of truth. There is no way to dam up the activity of the Christ. Nor is there any way to prevent the individuals receiving it who is ready for it none. Your readiness for it is the production of it in your consciousness. And it just so happens that I'm here to voice it to you. But if I weren't, some other way would be found for it to reach your consciousness because the time has come in your evolving life when it had to appear. And here it is. Now in the same way, tomorrow is another day. And perhaps tomorrow there may be another message or there may be another mission for you. There may be another work, another activity. There's no power to prevent it coming to you. The fact that you may be a prisoner in prison or a prisoner in a hospital or the fact that you may be so busy supporting your family or doing housework for a big family, do you think for a moment that that could prevent the activity of God reaching you? No, God has a way to wipe all those things aside. God's way would wipe aside every obstruction. Never believe that the activity of the Christ can be impaired, impeded, delayed, hindered. There was a word in the Bible for that about let. Who could let it? Who could hinder it? Who could prevent it? Nothing. Nothing. And so as you would realize that God really is the author of your life, that God is the creative principle of your being, that God uh, is your very wisdom and strength and health and wholeness and immortality, you would know right now that nothing could prevent that abundance appearing in you. Oh, probably for a day or two or a week or a year, you might brush it aside with I'm too busy or I haven't got time or the inclination, but that is only while you are being readied inside. When the moment has come, you would have no more opportunity for preventing it than the unborn child has of being born when its moment arrives to appear on the scene. No, there are forces of nature which would throw it right out into expression if there weren't a doctor around. 
forces of nature that would bring it forth into manifestation and nothing could prevent it when its time has come. And so nothing can prevent the fruitage appearing in your life when its time has come. And so I bring you this word. There's no responsibility on your shoulder. There, you need have no concern as to whether you are doing what is right or what is necessary to bring this into expression because you have nothing to do with bringing it into expression and you have nothing to do with preventing its coming into expression. The government is on its shoulder. Let it have its way with you. Yes, because now it has been revealed to you from the depths of your being that there is an I there that has come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now that you know that you can sit back and hear, I will never leave you nor forsake you. If you go through the waters, you will not drown. If you go through the fire, the flames will not kindle upon you for... I am with thee. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I am with you unto the end of the world. And you'll realize that there is an I deep down within your being and that the responsibility is on its shoulder. And you'll never again be concerned as to whether you are studying enough or having enough classes or meditating enough because it takes over your life and it will see that you do all the meditating that you should do that you will do all of the studying that you must do, that you will perform all those things in the outer that are necessary to your present and immediate experience. The government is on its shoulder. So, in this moment, please give up personal responsibility. Give up all sense of personal condemnation, criticism. Just as you know now that any criticism, judgment, or condemnation of your neighbor is a bearing witness to a lie, so you must know now that any sense of self-condemnation, self-criticism, self-judgment is but a catering to that personal sense of I that would trip you up if you listen to it. But listen to that I that is deep within your own being, the I that is the Christ of your being, and be led of that spirit. You'll be surprised. One of these days you'll even see the hand reach up right through you, in you, as if to come right out here into manifestation and place your glory and your experience and your activity into your hand from within you, not bring it to you from without. You can actually witness the hand of God within you as it comes up in here and says, here is your good. Coming to you from within, not from without. Coming to you from the kingdom of God, which is within you. Not coming to you from man whose breath is in his nostril. Not coming to you from a, a man who would give or who would withhold or who could give or who could withhold. The hand of God does not withhold. The hand of God does not punish. The hand of God does not limit. Therefore, be dependent on the hand of God. And the hand of God appears upward from within. It does not come from without. Although, as it comes up from within, it would seem to you that it's being brought to you from without. Just the same as this word of God for which you have been preparing yourself for thousands of years this word of God for which you are now at this moment ready appears to you to be coming through my lips but that's only a picture in the outer actually it is coming up to you from the very depths of your being and as it comes it says to you don't you see this is the truth prepared for you from the beginning of time. This is the feast, the bread, the wine, the water prepared for you from the beginning of time. Take and eat.
Now, as you look out on the world, you are going to behold, and perhaps in a greater degree soon than even than now, you will behold what will appear as distress in the world. And uh, it may be on <coughs> a uh, small scale, maybe on a large scale, maybe very close to you at hand, maybe far off, maybe among your family or friends, neighbors, maybe across the seas. But you will witness in appearance the natural result of these last 30, 40 years of uh, selfish living, warring, and all the rest of the things that you have seen witnessed in the world all of which takes a toll from those who believe in uh, gain at another's expense, a toll that is natural for those who live by the sword since they must die by the sword. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. In the human picture, this is inevitable. In the same wise, if you depend on your physical strength and you lift a hundred or a hundred and fifty pound weight, which is undoubtedly too much for any of us, there would be a physical breakdown from it, more than likely. But if you were in the realization of the Godhead as your strength, as the Christ bearing your burden and for any reason you had to lift this hundred or hundred and fifty pound you, you would find that you could do it without inconvenience and without harm to yourself you would be doing it through your Christhood not through your physical effort well and so uh, you would be then uh, reaping uh, spiritual strength because you had sown spiritual truth. In the same wise, if you understand God as the source of your supply and realize that the Christ is forever pouring it forth to you and you lose your sense of fear about it, your sense of responsibility, it flows naturally. You are now reaping your spiritual bread, wine, water, meat, Ah, but on the other hand, the man who has accepted the material sense of life and uh, believes that money is his supply or labor and then comes and finds that he has no money and has no labor, then comes lack and limitation. And of course, you see, he is merely reaping the material sense of supply that he has sown. In the same way, the man who accepts the belief that he can benefit at your expense sooner or later comes to the point where someone benefits as his expense. In other words, he reaps what he has sown. Back in the Oriental teaching, this is called karma, but in the Christian teaching, it is called reaping as ye have sown. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. Now, there are two ways of helping the world in this situation when it begins to reap and uh, reap badly. There are two ways to help. If we have storehouses and bonds, we can help with our storehouses and bonds. But usually no one, no nation, has enough in uh, those cases. Like the present day, when uh, one nation here is trying to be the storehouse and barn for all of Europe and all of Asia and is discovering that it hasn't enough 
with which to meet the need. We have a better remedy. We can help. We can help them in such a way not only that it will meet their immediate need, but eventually bring about a condition in which there will be no more need. Our way would be this. Think of our tree and remember that they too are branches and that they are at one with the spiritual vine in spite of all appearances to the contrary. In spite of all appearances, when you see your neighbor, your relative, in want, in lack, yes, if you can help him materially over the spot, do so, but give him the greater thing, and that is your remembrance of the tree. Your remembrance of the fact that as a branch of the tree, the same Christ is feeding them that is feeding you. You see, if the only reason they lack is because they are not yet consciously aware of the fact that there is an invisible source upon which they can draw. But your realization of the truth for them sets them into their conscious at one and acts as a treatment, as a prayer for them and establishes them in it. I told this uh, story in uh, Seattle and then uh, had a climax to it in the form of a confirmation. A young lady in uh, Honolulu, after one of our evening uh, classes or lectures, went home in the bus. And uh, in this bus was an intoxicated man. And uh, she very naturally and promptly, properly realized Christ as the true nature of all being and knew that uh, there wasn't anyone anywhere anytime except the branch of the vine fed, maintained, sustained by this vine. Whatever the nature of her realization was it wasn't long before this man uh, turned around and said thanks lady for praying for me and he was sober. Well, it just happened that a few nights later, a young lady in our class in Seattle, after the class, went into the coffee shop of the hotel, and all the way at the other end of the counter was a man very much intoxicated and uh, very loud. And she likewise realized uh, the truth of being in whatever form, whatever thought came to her, I don't know. But it was a realization because very soon, this man turned around and said, who is that girl with the red ribbon in her hair? And came down and for a half hour talked to her about God. Now you see, there is an invisible thread binding all of us together. The thread is Christ. If we are the branches, then we are all attached to one tree, one trunk, one vine, and uh, only one thing is necessary for our demonstration, that we realize this truth. That we realize that I am my own self, can do nothing, can be nothing. Why callest thou me good? There is but one good, the Father. And the Father is pouring that goodness through the Christ out into expression as my goodness. Ah, yes. But if you claim that for yourself, and do not claim it for your brother, your prayer is of no avail. If you come to the altar to pray, and there remember that your brother has ought against thee, first go and make peace with him. Then come back to the altar. All of that just means this. If you are going through any discord, any inharmony, if you are having any sense of separation, from the source of your being and you are entertaining any belief about your brother as to his lack or limitation or his erroneous nature or his separation from good uh, get up first stop praying for yourself and establish your peace 
in the realization that all men are one in Christ that everyone is fed from the same spring the same source that we are all one all branches of the one tree the tree of life which is God and uh, as we realize that we set our brother free and in setting our brother free we set ourselves free because there is no freedom for us as long as we entertain in thought bondage for another if you are not at peace with your brother if you are not seeing your brother as uh, equally forgiven as you if you are not seeing your brother equally fed maintained and sustained from the same source you cannot have freedom for yourself why we are joint heirs with Christ and God joint heirs we're all one in Christ Jesus, in truth, in spiritual being. And so it becomes necessary not merely to give treatments that I and my father are one, or that you are spiritual and perfect, but to realize that Christ <coughs> is every man's freedom. Christ is every man's supply. Christ is the life and soul and being. Christ is the essence and substance. Spiritual man is the truth about all creation. Appearances has nothing to do with that. We're not interested in appearances. We're not judging appearances. We are judging righteous judgment. We are not seeing out of limited, finite eyes. We are seeing out of the eyes, the windows of the soul. And what do we behold when we see with our soul? We see that we are brothers and sisters. We see that we are one in Christ Jesus. We see that whatever would affect one limb would affect the whole body. And so we are equally careful about seeing that the needs of our fellow man are supplied as our own, since we are one in Christ and we are infinite. We are infinite in and of ourselves, no. We are self-complete in our Godhood. And that is the truth that we realize for our brother. And so as we witness these experiences of sin, disease on the street, accident, limitation, as we witness these troubles in foreign countries or our own troubles in uh, war and so forth, what we are called on to do is to stop beholding it from the human standpoint and begin to behold the picture in Christ which is that we are all one with that vine fed, maintained, sustained and protected. In doing that we come to a place of self-completeness in which I do not have to go out and concern myself for Joel. I do not have to go out and manipulate the outer picture. I have to only retire into meditation, uh, realize there my conscious oneness with God, commune with God, and realize that in that oneness with God, uh, I am one with all men, with all being. And then, as I can serve, I am led to those I can serve. As I can be served, those are led to me who can and uh, by the activity of the Christ not by the activity of human thought or planning or human footsteps in uh, putting this wisdom into practice you will find that as temptations come, we call problems temptations or appearances. As the temptation comes to take thought for some outer condition, how shall this be accomplished? How am I going to get this done? In what manner can this be achieved? Or how will I go about this? Or what should I do about this? The remedy is in this. 
as fast as possible get into a quiet corner and sit down and realize that the answer lies within you. The answer to it lies in the Christ of your being, not up here in your thinking capacity. This applies not only to the minor experiences of daily living, but to the major experiences of life. It may well be that you're called upon tomorrow to build a tunnel through a mountain and you say it can't be done and there is no way for it to be done. How will I do it? But again, even in that, the answer lies within your own being. You learn to turn to the Christ of your being and you will find that it will not be long until the way will be revealed to you how to tunnel through this mountain. Or perhaps you are called on for something exceeding your present financial ability to meet. And you say, it can't be done. It's an impossibility. I haven't got it or the means to get it. And again, you start thinking, planning, hoping, despairing, when the simple remedy would be to wait, wait. The answer already lies established within my being. Get quiet. You see, we are now living in our self-completeness in God so that we do not go externally to find the answer to our problems. We now go within. As we would, for instance, if we were searching for two times two, that is, if we were searching for the answer to two times two, we would go within and let four come to us, reveal itself. If we were trying to remember our home address or telephone number, we would go within and let it come forward to us. Well, be assured of this. Every detail of your life for the next 7,000 years is already complete and established way down deep in your consciousness. And you can turn there for the answer to any problem. There is no problem so deep, so involved, so enormous that the answer doesn't lie within you. Why? The kingdom of God, the kingdom of allness is within you. Now instead of going out here to search for the answer first, go within first and then the answer will appear if necessary out here. The answer may come to you directly from within your being, but it doesn't make a difference if it doesn't and can't. You'll get a letter in the mail in plenty of time with your answer or a telegram or a telephone call. You will be led, you will be, di di you will be directed, but only if you start on the basis of our new life. Self-completeness in God. I can turn to the Father within me now for all demonstration, for all that is necessary. And as you practice that, as you learn to withdraw your dependence on outside avenues, you will find that it is literally true you are self-complete. Self-complete. You could be out in a rubber boat in the middle of the ocean or lost in the desert. But in this self-completeness, your food would appear three times a day and your drinking water and uh, guidance back home. But only, only if you could retire within your own being and there realize I am self-complete through God. Godhood, the depth, the kingdom of God within me is infinite, full and complete, and forever flowing forth, forever revealing itself, disclosing itself to my Joelhood. The Christhood of me is revealing the completeness of the Joelhood, all from within. And yet sometimes the answer comes through people in the without, through circumstance and conditions, but it doesn't come from them, it comes through them. It comes from the depth of our own being. Only believe this. 
Believe in your self-completeness in God. Believe that you can turn to the kingdom of God within you for any answer, for any supply, for any wisdom, for any love, for any cooperation, for any help, for anything necessary in your experience. Only believe that you can turn within and make that contact, receive that assurance of God's presence, and then watch your good appear in the without. It would have been no surprise to me if three quarters of all of you here had not come back tonight. I had an idea that you'd get frightened off with that meditation. And it either means that uh, you didn't succeed with it or that you did, one or the other. <laughs> That meditation of uh, the sacrifice of our material good, of our material sense of existence, <coughs> this must be practiced. This cannot merely be heard from a platform and benefit one it must be practiced, it must be part, must be made a part of uh, individual consciousness. And so tonight I'm going to bring to you a little more of this temple worship or approaching to the presence of God. Since we realize that we cannot come into the presence of God carrying our burdens. This temple of the Hebrews of old, the courtyard, was shaped just like this room in front of me. And the entrance was here. And one came into the courtyard and found first this burning brazier, this fire into which went the sacrifice. And this sacrifice is materiality. Whatever it is that seems of value to us, and strangely enough, <clears throat> the sacrifice that is demanded of us is the sacrifice of our material concepts. It isn't only that we throw away our money, we never throw that away, but we throw away, we consign to the fire our belief that money is supply. Unless we discard that belief, we cannot come into the realization of our self-completeness in God. In other words, that our supply is already complete within us from uh, the moment of our beginning to the moment of our so-called ending and that at no period in between are we ever in lack or in limitation except in proportion as we accept the materialistic idea that we must have money in order to have supply. No. If we have supply, we will have money. Supply is our consciousness of truth. Supply is our awareness of this relationship between the branch and the vine and the Godhead. The moment a person has an awareness of their identity as the branch, forever one with the vine, which in turn is forever one with the Godhead, never again will they be out of money. Because now they have supply, and supply is the substance of which money is formed. 
you do not go out and get a clay figure until you first have the clay first the clay then the figure because the clay is the substance of the figure so with this you can't go out and get money without first getting the substance of money and the substance of money is Christ spirit soul truth truth entertained in consciousness is the substance of money the truth about our relationship to God is the substance of money and having that substance it appears as form it may appear as money automobiles houses it can appear in any form but first there must be a substance before there can be a form and so the knowledge of our relationship to God the awareness of our oneness with God through the vine the understanding of that relationship of the tree branch vine and ground that understanding is the substance of our supply now we have to give up also sacrifice if you will throw into the furnace our concept of health even our concept of good health why our concept of good health says that a heart beating so much lungs doing this liver doing that digestive organs doing this eliminative organs doing this that constitutes health no now we sacrifice that that isn't true healthy organs and functions do not constitute health health is the realization of God as the source of all activity and the substance of all form that awareness becomes uh, visible as the health of our body again there is no such thing as health of body without a, a foundational substance and the foundational substance is spiritual wisdom and so as you discard your material concept that if you just had a good heart liver or lung you'd be healthy or if you had just had a good brain you'd be smart sacrifice that concept quickly and realize that God is the substance of all form God is the activity of all being God is the law unto its own creation and when you have that spiritual wisdom it will appear as health and so you give up your mortal and material sense of wealth you give up your mortal and material sense of health without ever giving up your wealth or your health in fact you gain more wealth and you gain more health as you give up your erroneous concepts and uh, go on into the uh, demonstration of the truth of being well we all have material concepts a family of friendships of our neighbors oh there's an important one we must give up our concept of what constitute neighbors and enemies oh yes we have a very material concept because we accept only those of our own uh, families or friendships or communities as friends and very often the fellow across the road of a different color race creed uh, uh, we accept them as strangers and sometimes as enemies and here we give up this materialistic concept of uh, human relationships for the spiritually real understanding of the tree all branches united in one Christ with all good flowing to all from God that is our spiritual relationship with each other one in Christ all one in Christ there shall be the neither Greek nor Jew bond nor free for we are all one in Christ and as you give up your human sense of human relationships 
your mortal and material concept of human relationships for the spiritually real relationship as uh, shown forth by the tree, you are sacrificing again that which is worthless to you and uh, receiving, in, receiving in exchange that which is divinely real. Well, you yourself can, in your meditation, go back in your mind and see what you are entertaining that is mortal, material, human, limited, finite, and throw it in that uh, furnace, throw it on that brazier, throw it into the fire, give it up, and uh, receive in exchange a spiritual counterpart, a spiritual reality. And that will be the first step of this meditation. When you are convinced that at least for this evening you have uh, dug out all of these material concepts to throw away, there'll be more tomorrow night I can assure you or the next night. It takes a long while to get down to the bottom of all the erroneous concepts we've been entertaining. But if we find one or two or three tonight that we hadn't thought of last night and we discard it, throw it away and accept in exchange the higher spiritual sense of being, we are then prepared for the next step. And that step takes place as we walk from the brazier here to uh, a place a half a dozen feet or a dozen feet up there where we find a laver, L-A-V-E-R, or a bath. Actually, it is a large round uh, tank filled with water. And there we perform the rite of purification. That is where we bathe ourselves internally and externally. And that is the rite of uh, purification. And of course, there's, no one has to tell you the things in your own mind of which you would like to be purified and of which you need to be purified because each one knows their own inner being better than anyone else. But it is pretty safe to say that uh, any one of us at almost any time could stand a little scrubbing in one place or another. And uh, no one knows it as well as we do, and no one knows what particular spot in our consciousness it is that needs a good soaping. But here is our opportunity now, as we stand before this bath, figuratively <coughs> bathing, washing, cleansing ourselves within and without. This whole thing, you see, is not a physical operation any more than uh, throwing sacrifice into the fire was an actual physical sacrifice. It all takes place as an activity within our consciousness. And so does our bathing, internal and external bathing, becomes an activity of our own consciousness in which we purify our sense of relationships, purify our sense of good, purify our sense of God and man, purify our sense in any way that we feel is necessary this particular evening. Again, perhaps tomorrow evening it will take a different form, but this evening we will purify ourselves of whatever it is that needs to be uh, cleansed within us. <coughs> If we have been faithful in that, we will find an opening just like that one between the two pillars. And this leads us into that second part of uh, the courtyard. <coughs> and on our right, we will see a table. And on the table will be loaves of showbread. 
This is not to be eaten, as you know. This showbread is there to reveal to you, and is always maintained there, to reveal to you the omnipresence of supply. The omnipresence of all good. And so you take your place by that table and contemplate that showbread. And using it as a symbol, you realize within your own being, just as this showbread is always here, so is the bread of life, the staff of life. So is all that stands for self-completeness, eternally, immortally, omnipresently, here and now. Where is here? Where I stand. Right where I stand is the showbread. Right where I stand forever is the omnipresence of the substance of life, the staff of life, the harmony of life, the good of life, the gift of God, in other words, showbread, there it is. And we fill our consciousness with the realization of this omnipresence of good within our own being, right where I stand always. Omnipresence is the word in connection with showbread. Omnipresence and infinity, because it's an infinite amount of substance, because it's of God. Infinite good, infinite substance of life. When we have filled our consciousness with a sense of abundance and a sense of the omnipresence of the abundance of all good, we walk over here to the left side and find another table. And on this table is a candelabra with uh, seven candles lit, always lighted, seven lighted candles. You will find these candelabras in Hebrew synagogues or in the homes of Orthodox Hebrew people. They always have had them, always do have them, because they symbolize for the Hebrew the ever-presence of spiritual light. And as we stand in the presence, metaphorically, of this and seven of course you know is always completeness allness and as we stand now in the presence of the seven candle candelabra lighted we fill ourselves with the realization of the omnipresence of spiritual light which means the presence of God the activity of Christ the Christ light in our experience and now right where we stand is the omnipresence of spiritual light. Right now where we stand in meditation is the omnipresence of the allness, the sevenness, the completeness of spiritual illumination. How much spiritual wisdom do you have now? All of it. All of it. Whether or not you are manifesting it is not the point. That would be judging by appearances. But remember, this self-completeness in God reveals that the full light of God, the full spiritual illumination, is complete within you now. Maybe necessary to dig down deep to open out a way for it to escape. Remember, it can't come to you Oh no, since last night we have been opening out a way for it to escape. So there must be the recognition that right where I am, uh, there is the sevenness, the completeness of spiritual light, of spiritual illumination, of spiritual wisdom. Right here within me now, where I am, uh, is the fullness of spiritual light, guidance, protection, wisdom. We fill ourselves with that wisdom. We fill ourselves with that remembrance of the omnipresence of spiritual good. 
spiritual understanding. Not that we must attain it. Oh, no, no. We are in the presence of the sevenness of it. We have it. When you pray, believe that you have received. Now we know that in the presence of this seven candle, candelabra lighted, that we are in the presence of our complete spiritual illumination, and we stand there meditating, pondering, letting it pour forth into expression. And when we are filled with it, we come back to the center and go a little ways further back, and there we find the burning incense in the incense burner. And that is the place of devotion, worship, sanctity, sacredness. In the presence of this incense, we have our thanksgiving. We have our praise for the all presence, the acknowledgement. We bring to conscious remembrance the different steps we've taken since we entered the entrance to the courtyard. We praise the Lord. We express inwardly our gratitude for the revelation of our self-completeness in God because all that we have found so far in this temple, you see, is a revelation of what is already established within our being. None of this are we praying for. None of this are we seeking to get. All of this we are finding already here within us. And for this we give praise, thanksgiving, devotion, worship, adoration. Whatever emotion is stirred within us at the tremendous revelation of our self-completeness in God. If we have done uh, this well, if our meditation has been gentle, slow, peaceful, calm, serene, we will find the mystery. For right in back of this <coughs> incense burner, there has been up to this time a curtain like a mist but now if we have come into the realization of our God being to the place where we can say oh now I see the mist disperses the curtain is withdrawn and it's all open space now right to the rear and in the rear is the Ark of the Covenant no one may approach the Ark of the Covenant except that they have been through each one of these steps successfully. Until they have been through each one of these steps and received at each step an inner assurance that all is well. And if they then come to this place of worship, of adoration, by that time there is no more mental or spiritual darkness and you can say, now I see. And what do you see? The Ark of the Covenant. The law of the Lord. And behold, since God is in the temple, you are standing in the presence of God. And in this realization, you receive from within a divine impulsion that lets you know that now you are standing in the presence of God. You have gone all the way from the front of the courtyard cluttered up with material concepts come all the way to the rear and divested yourself of all false trusts false confidences impurities and uh, then uh, in this moment of adoration of worship of thanksgiving and praise you find the mist dispersed and here is the presence of God announcing itself and reminding you, I am ever with you. I was with you in the beginning when you were cluttered up with those material things and material concepts, but you couldn't behold me then. This mist was across your eyes, across your awareness, across your consciousness, and this mist could not be dispersed 
until all the things that caused the mist, that were the substance of the mist, had been dispelled from your consciousness, and when the substance of the mist was dispelled, the mist itself disappeared, and you stood in the presence of the Holy of Holies. And that is what it is called, the Ark of the Lord. The law, the Holy of Holies. And so, as you go through this meditation, which is, without doubt, the highest uh, form of meditation that has yet presented itself to us, you will find that each time that you perform these rites, you will find yourself in the presence of the Lord. You see, the Hebrews of old knew, at least the leaders and teachers knew, that no one can enter the presence of the Lord except in holiness, except in true spirituality, and for that reason only the priests really ever got all the way back there to the Holy of Holies. But we understand today that priest symbolically means spiritualized man. The spiritual realization of our identity, the realization of our spiritual identity makes us a priest. That is why anyone can be a practitioner, anyone can be a spiritual teacher who has in a measure realized his priesthood. That is, his grace, his powers derived from the soul. And in that degree, one is a priest. And so, how could one feel the healing gift? How could one feel the divine presence if they were completely filled and surrounded with mortal and material concepts? Nobody has ever been a spiritual healer whose faith and confidence and trust was in the outer world. Only in proportion as they had overcome in one way or another their faith, hope, and trust in external means, exterior help, only in that proportion could they become spiritual healers and spiritual teachers because all there is to spiritual healing and teaching is a revelation of the great truth that one's substance, supply, health, harmony, wholeness, completeness is a flowing from within, from the depths of withinness to the without. And so only those who have divested themselves in one way or another from these mortal material concepts ever reach the end of the meditation where they find God, find themselves in the presence of the Holy of Holies. Now, if you should meditate tomorrow or tonight before retiring and find that you can't work yourself all the way back there, and remember, you can't, you can't skip any part of it. It can't be done. There's no cheating in this game. You just find you won't reach it unless each step has been f performed thoroughly and well. But if you do not reach it tonight, do not despair. There's always tomorrow and tomorrow's tomorrow. And ultimately, with persistence, with practice, with an earnest desire to be free of the mortal concepts of existence and the so-called impurities, which means a belief in good outside of one's own being. With that desire, there isn't any question but what we come to the end of the road. And at the end of the road, find our holy of holies or find ourselves consciously present with the Lord. From then on, that word I sings within our being. We never again voice it. We never again say, I am spiritual, or I am uh, spirit, or I am God, or I am Christ. From then on, the word I is so sacred that we never voice it, we only hear it. Then, when that I becomes so sacred, that you do not voice it, but merely hear it from within, you are hearing the voice come right out of that holy 
of holies. As you complete this work and find yourself standing at the Holy of Holies, feel the presence of God, you make a natural transition and uh, you are no longer a branch on the tree. Standing in the presence of that Holy of Holies, or even before that, standing by the table of showbread, realizing the omnipresence of divine supply within your own being, and standing at that uh, table at the left, and realizing the omnipresence of spiritual wisdom, spiritual light and illumination, even there you are no longer the branch, you are now the vine. You are now that place through which this showbread and light are flowing. And you are now the vine, and you take on a new relationship to the entire world. Now you may assume that the branches are those who do not yet know their true identity, that do not yet know of uh, their self-completeness in God. And so you now stand in relationship to them as uh, the Christ, the vine. Because now you are filled with the divine bread of life, and you are filled with the light of truth, now you are the Christ, and uh, you feed and heal the multitudes. Now it is your realization of omnipresence. It is your realization of the omnipresence of good and the omnipresence of spiritual wisdom that makes you the Christ and makes you the one able to feed and to heal the multitudes. Why? Because now you can say, I have meat the world knows not. I have bread and wine and water. Now you have come into the realization of the omnipresence of that spiritual light and spiritual substance and now you can say, oh, I embody the substance of life, the staff of life, the bread. I embody the light of the world. I am the light of the world. The world, light of the world is embodied in me. The bread of life is embodied in me. The staff of life, that is the realization that comes at those two tables, isn't it? That all of this good is embodied within me. Well, now you realize that you're the Christ. That the Godhead now is flowing through you. And therefore, this truth that you know now becomes the bread and the light unto the world. Now you can say, I am the light of the world. The light in me flows out to the world. The bread of life in me, the staff of life, flows out to feed, support, maintain, and heal the world. Not of myself. Oh, no, no, no. I'm rooted and grounded in God in the realization of omnipresence. But the realization of omnipresence constitutes my Christhood. Do you see that? The realization of omnipresence of good constitutes my Christhood. What made Jesus the Christ? His realization of the omnipresence of good. Is that true? Certainly. That's what made him the Christ. Before that, he was a carpenter, and then later he was a rabbi. But now, he's the savior of the world. What makes that change? The realization of the omnipresence of the bread of life. The realization of the omnipresence of the spiritual life. The realization that his own consciousness was illumined. 
That made him the Christ. That makes you the Christ. That makes you the avenue through which spiritual wisdom, love, life, truth flows into all the branches. Those who do not yet know the source of all good. And so even before you come to the Holy of Holies, the moment you gain your recognition and realization of omnipresence, that constitutes your Christhood. You are only a branch until you came to the realization of omnipresence within you, and then the realization of omnipresence within you constitutes your Christhood and makes you the practitioner, the teacher, the helper, the guide to all those who now turn as branches into you. Is that clear? It should be clearer by tomorrow night if you will devote some time tonight and tomorrow to this. Please let us remember that this is a week not only of instruction but practice and that this meditation is the most important work that we have had up to date. We, I say, in the infinite way. It is the most important work that we have had in the entire infinite way work up to date because we have already seen in the experience of those who have learned this meditation that when consciously performed it leads them right to the temple of God to the Ark of the Covenant and uh, <clears throat> it becomes a daily source of inspiration always the moment we have divested ourselves of our mortal and material concepts the moment we have come to stand before that showbread and uh, the lights and come into the realization why here and now within me is the kingdom of God we have established our Christhood our sonship in God our heritage as joint heirs with Christ and God and from that moment on we feed and heal the multitudes and so until tomorrow night thank you Good morning, this is Joel in White Key. I am in my apartment overlooking the mountains. The hills from whence cometh my help. In this temple meditation, the entire point is the raising of one's consciousness until one reaches an elevation from which they look out upon this universe of God and behold only that which God beholds knows only that which God knows I look under the hills from whence cometh my help I look up into the heightened consciousness into the consciousness of the most high just as the temple meditation serves to lift us in consciousness to the awareness of God itself just as it lifts us into the very atmosphere of God 
So, as we look into the hills, or as we learn to take our silent, quiet walks in the park, in flower gardens, by the river or lake, so do we learn in our aloneness to reach the heights, those very mountains from whence cometh our help. You see, our help comes from the height of our spiritual vision. Our help comes from the degree of our mountaintop experiences. Anything that serves to lift us in consciousness above the clamor of the senses, above the noises of this world will serve to bring us into an atmosphere of peace. And uh, what do you think that you find when you reach the divine consciousness? When we touch the center of our being, when we reach the divine heights of inspiration, we find God. But we find that it is literally true that God is not a God of battle. God is not a God of power. No more than God is a God of vengeance, as we formerly learned or believed. God is a deep silence. God is a stillness, a stillness of all that is human. God is not a power. God is a deep well of stillness, of silence, of peace, and quietness and in confidence we find our strength in God we find our strength for God is quietness confidence peace as we attain the heights of revelation we find no great powers wrecking and ruining the evil forces of the world, we find there are no evil forces of the world. There is only one, one being, spirit, one cause, spirit, one activity, Spirit, one life, the soul of you and the soul of me. There is nothing in that soul that contends, argues, battles, or rises above. There is a deep-seated peace. 
there is a joy there is a harmony as we attain the atmosphere of God whether we have worked our way up there through the temple meditation or whether we have accomplished it by looking up into the hills around our city up into the sky at night into the stars and about the moon or whether we have attained it by a quiet walk by the lake in the park we find always the same thing peace a sense of peace and a sense of stillness and a sense of joy no doubt you are having problems to meet in your personal life there may still be evidences of illness unhappiness lack discord of one name or nature or another and uh, in trying to meet these you have known about all of the truth that you know you have declared and stated all that you have found in scripture and in the writings and it may well be that the time now has come to lift yourself above might and power even of declared truth and rest more in the atmosphere of his spirit in that deep well of contentment you might try it live through the temple meditation again or having done that take a walk out into the evening or late afternoon and find a quiet place to sit and meditate perhaps even in some church that is not having a meeting in quietness in confidence sit and wait be still just be still and wait and listen for the voice you are not in need of any power with which to meet any problem your only need now is stillness quietness confidence assurance and these things come to you from within as a peace be still then in this holy atmosphere of God you behold the meaning of one here O Israel the Lord our God is one one being 
one law, one life. The time is coming when the students of the infinite way will begin to understand God as one and will no longer attempt to use God to use truth or even to think of God as a power over error. Of old, only the priests were allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. But today, in our enlightenment, we know that spiritualized man is a priest. Every man is a priest as he attains a spiritual consciousness, as he attains some measure of awareness of God. In attaining the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, we are attaining the state of consciousness of the priest, that is, the one who not only serves God, but is supported by God. You see, the very robe of the priest, his emblem of office, is also the source of his supply. That is a little secret that we have in the message of the infinite way, that as you attain spiritual consciousness, an awareness of God, you automatically put on the robe of priesthood and then learn that your health unfolds from that robe, from that attained state of spiritual consciousness and that your supply unfolds from the same source, not by might, nor by power, not by a struggle out in the world, but by the invisible robe you now wear. The invisible robe that denotes you have attained priesthood. In consciousness, you have attained the spiritual state of consciousness from which now all your good will unfold. Oh, it is so beautiful to come to a place where there is no struggle, no strife, a place in consciousness from which we watch, behold, the very wonderful good of God revealing itself in our experience. This is the place in consciousness to which we are coming because we look to the hills for our help, we look to our own enlightened state of consciousness. We look 
to the heights of spiritual, spiritual development that we ourselves attain and from the deep within we watch the beauties of God unfold unto the experiences of the without. Aloha, aloha, this is Joel.